Hello friends, in the series of my talks on this issue of post URP obstructive low urinary symptoms when patient develops new onset obstructive low urinary symptoms and in my previous talk I focused on where patients develop youthful structure, how should you diagnose that and how should you treat this. In this video, I am concentrating on another area of narrowing which is at the level of bladder neck. Has the patient developed bladder neck stenosis? Now bladder neck stenosis previously was called post URP bladder neck contracture. But today the SIU ICDS consultation group has specified that you call it post URP bladder neck stenosis. So that's the word we shall be using hands on. Now if you see a normal prostatic fossa after a well done transuther resection, it should look something like this. Verum montanum, right? And then as you go in, you will see widely open bladder neck and supple bladder neck, no scarring. It's all round, wide. The fossa is well epithelized. But then some patients develop stenosis at the level of bladder neck. So why they develop stenosis bladder neck? In many patients, there are some preoperative factors which are playing role. Say for instance, the prostate may be having some degree of inflammatory process going on and which keeps the fibrotic activity going on. There are some patients who are smoker, there are some patients who have had radiation exposure. So if the patient is like this, then he has more chance of developing bladder neck stenosis. There are certain important intraoperative factors and then there are some postoperative factors. Postoperative, if the operator applies traction at the bladder neck for long duration or if the patient has developed persistent low urinary tract infection after transurethral resection and in intraoperative factors remember few important technical points if the operator has done very deep resection at the level of bladder neck and he's cauterized the trigonal area or if the you know cautery has been used circumferentially all over all around the bladder neck or else a deep subtrigonal injury has been created which heals later on with fibrosis. Now I would like you to show some representative retrograde urethrogram pictures. Here is a patient who has normal anterior urethra but you will appreciate there is some narrowing at the level of bladder neck. In this urethrogram you will appreciate narrowing at the level of more appropriately a fine streak of contrast is going in the bladder. In this patient, again, you will notice same thing, a fine a dilated prostatic urethra and a fine streak going across the stenotic segment of bladder neck into bladder. In this patient, as the technician injects contrast in urethra and then it meets the resistance at the level of bladder neck, there's a positive pressure. So the urethra looks very distended. The entire penile, bulbar, sphincteric, membranous, prostatic urethra is distended. And you can also see some backflow of contrast in prostatic ducts. This is because of high pressure in this part of the urethral segment. And then the contrast is escaping into the stenotic segment and then into the bladder. In this patient, which is the worst type of bladder neck stenosis, not even a drop of contrast is going into the bladder. And it is dilating the prostatic urethra and as well as creating reflux into prostatic ducts. So you have seen these varieties of bladder neck stenosis. Here again, in another patient, complete block at the level of bladder neck stenosis. There may be small passage somewhere, patients trickling urine, these patients are often in a state of chronic urine retention and overflow. And now I want you to have a look at these three retrograde urethrograms and concentrate at the level of bladder neck in all these three. Do you think that the degree of the disease process resulting into bladder neck stenosis is in same in all the patients? I don't think so. The disease severity is, is variable and therefore the treatment should also vary in these patients. In clinical practice, you will have lots of variations in the morphology of bladder neck stenosis. The stenotic segment will vary in the length. Length I mean vertical length. Then the degree of fibrotic process will be variable in terms of the depth. And then the location of the stenotic hole 
will also vary. So these things will be variable in all the patients. If this is the normal appearance of the prostatic fossa and bladder neck after a good transuterine resection, and you want to learn what variations are possible in the location of bladder neck stenosis, this is a stenosed bladder neck at the center hole. In most patients, you will notice that this hole is displaced more towards the 12 o'clock, like that. So it's anteriorly located towards, you know, if you examine the patient in lithotomy, you will notice this hole is not in the center, but it is more towards the, the anterior part, the 12 o'clock in the vision. Regarding the variation in depth of fibrosis, if you look at this bladder stenosis, and I have tried to show you with the white thing, adjoining the stenotic hole, the fibrotic component, which can be very thin or it can be as deep or it can be as deep. So the fibrotic process, the depth wise, the scar will depth wise will also vary. In terms of the length, the vertical length, the stenotic segment can be very flimsy, mucosal flimsy, like the one here. You're doing a cystoscopy of a patient who has come to you with the obstructed low urinary symptom. And then as you go into the prostatic urethra, you will see the area of the stenosis. Now here I'd like you to observe the most of the resection has been done at the level of bladder neck. In the area of apex and the lower part of the prostate operator has not done much job. And this is the hole, stenotic hole, which is looking like a very thin, flimsy, membranous septum between the prostatic urethra and bladder. So you pass a guide wire through that hole and over the guide wire, just try to advance your scope. You will notice that without much resistance, just by small click, you will go inside the bladder and this fibrous septum is torn. And that's how the interior of the bladder is. No evidence of infection, not much of a problem, normal orifices. And uh, as you come out, you will see the, you will see the, the, look at the edges of the broken septum. It's very thin edges. They are bleeding also a little bit. So part of the job you have done by opening this obstruction and as now the patient will void, this defect will open more and more, more and more and most of the patients remain okay. So this is an example of a thin fibrotic bladder neck stenosis. In some patients, the, the vertical length, the vertical height of this bladder neck stenosis can be longer, more, and it can be spanning into area of 5 to 10 millimeter. Here is a, another video. And uh, I like you to appreciate the difference in the severity of disease in this case vis-a-vis -vis the one that you saw earlier. Sometimes you take time in finding out where is the area of the snows to the bladder neck. Now look at this bladder neck, which is a thick bladder neck stenosis. And again, you can put a wire, a uretic catheter through that narrow hole. And if you want to dilate with the cystoscope sheath and the amount of pressure that you may have to exert will tell you that how bad is the fibrotic process. You can push it, but you need to exert and then you can go inside the urinary bladder. So obviously the, the, the element of fibrosis in this case is far more as compared to what was there in the earlier case. Now this is the third situation where the vertical length of stenotic segment is longer than a centimeter. It does not involve the bladder neck alone, but it involves the, the proximal prostatic urethra also. So friends, clinical variants therefore can be many. You can have a case of bladder neck stenosis alone, or you can have a case of bladder neck stenosis with another obstructive factor. Till now, I told you what are the different grades of bladder neck stenosis alone. But then you can have this combined with another obstructive factor in the low urinary tract, either a stricture or a residual prostate. So you have to diagnose everything and then treat the patient. 
here's a video of a patient who has uh, adhesions in the area of bladder neck and he also have some residual prostate now look at this video carefully as you advance the scope through the synctric urethra and the Veru Montanum view the one row of the prostate is grown more and you, on top part of the endoscopic vision you notice a semilunar adhesion a semi, that's it and as you advance it inside the adhesion is broken and the lobes get separated so this was a partial adhesion which was not allowing the lateral lobes to fall apart at the time of widening. The adhesion was beginning from this location. You can see fresh bleeding because of recent attempt to tear the adhesion. And this adhesion was just distilled to bladder neck between one part of the prostatic lobe with the other prostatic lobe. So such situations can happen in clinical practice. Here, you need to resect this residual prostate also if you want your patient to have a good outcome. So thank you very much for your time. In case you have any question or comments, you can write on my email or visit our website, Dalila Academy of Urology for similar videos.